This is Lee Collins, and I am the youth pastor at Grace United Methodist Church, and we are excited, really excited about what's going to be coming up on Saturday, March 29th. We are excited, if that's the word I can keep using, uh, to have Chris Coleman, the Chris Coleman Band, coming up to lead us in worship on Saturday night, March the 29th. This is a worship event slash fundraiser for our youth ministry here at Grace United Methodist Church. And what this fundraiser is going towards is our youth ministry here at Grace is growing. Um, last year we took the opportunity to go to a camp um, conference down in Panama City which is called Big Stuff. And Big Stuff is a national camp that is ran not only in Panama City but in Daytona Beach. And we took last year 17 kids uh, to this conference. And this year we are taking 29 kids. And we know that this is a, a big burden that's going to be there financially. And, and for the kids themselves, we don't want the kids to have to pay for the entire cost on their own. We want to try to help them out any way we can. So Chris Coleman um, is going to be coming up. He and his band members and some other uh, some great, great musicians are part of the worship team that lead the Big Stuff Conference. They're actually there for all those weeks leading down in Panama. So they're going to be here in Abbeville, South Carolina, leading worship, and they're going to be helping us uh, raise awareness for these kids that are going to be going on this great camp trip coming up in June. And so the cost is $5 at the door. We're asking a $5 uh, donation at the door, and then we're also going to be taking up an additional love offering uh, during the concert. Uh, which, by the way, um, members of our youth who are going to be going on the trip will be doing a, a special song during that time. Uh, we'll have a video package uh, much like this that will be playing you know, with some testimonies from some of the kids. Uh, and then the concert itself is a worship event. Chris Coleman Band will be here, and we're excited about having him here. The doors open at 6.30. Concert starts at 7. We're encouraging all youth groups to be here. We're encouraging youth groups uh, from around the area to come. Um, Chris and them are located out of Georgia, um, so they don't have too, too far to have to come. But uh, we're encouraging college students as well, adults. We have a bunch of adults who are coming to this uh, who have been spreading the word here. So um, we just want to have a full house. And all the money, all the money that we raise that night will go straight into our trip and will help pay uh, for those 29 kids part of what they're uh, needing to go on this trip. And so we really want to encourage you to be here. We really need... A, a big crowd to be here. We want to we want to pack it out. We want to get 300 people in here. So uh, hopefully our youth group has stepped up to the challenge. They'll get the word out. Hopefully you can help us do that as well. And we're looking forward to what's going to be taking place. March 29th, 630 the doors open. Chris Coleman Band here at Grace United Methodist Church in Abbeville. We look forward to seeing you there as well. God bless. Welcome to Grace United Methodist Church. We are glad that you are here this morning, glad that you've chosen to be a part of worship here. If you are a uh, first-time guest with us this morning, we especially welcome you here and, uh, and are glad that you are here. A few announcements I do want to point out to us all this morning to make sure we're just in the know of some things going on. If you open up your order of worship, you'll see uh, a lot going on in the life of the church. You'll see that today um, Grace on Wheels is running immediately following the worship service. Grace on Wheels is a ministry of the church, a mission ministry of the church where we go into neighborhoods and um, folks who are less fortunate than we are and even into some of the neighborhoods of, of senior citizens who um, maybe do not have lunch today. We're going to be providing food for them, and we need your help to go and to deliver that food. So if you're able, we ask that you would uh, stay after a few minutes um, after, after worship and, and go out and help serve. It will probably take 30 to 40 minutes max to deliver the meals, and then you can go on your way for the rest of today. Um, Easter play practices today from 4 to 6. If you have signed up to be a part of the Easter play, we ask that you be here um, today from 4 to 6. Our youth, um, we, we are down some youth this morning because they are at an FCA retreat that was down at the beach this weekend. They'll be coming back um, this afternoon. And so uh, we ask that you continue to keep them in prayer as they are traveling for Traveling Mercies. And uh, there will be no youth tonight. Just no youth tonight. Lee will just be getting in. And uh, he needs to go home and be with his family. So, no youth tonight. You did hopefully see the uh, video that was shown just a few minutes ago, a few seconds ago, um, advertising the Chris Coleman concert next Saturday afternoon, evening. Uh, doors open at 6.30. It's $5 at the door, and then we'll have a love offering. Um, hopefully you heard him say, but if not, I will reiterate. Some of our own youth who sing in the worship team are going to be singing that night too. 
And so that's something to celebrate. So we hopefully, adults, you will be here if you are able and that you will invite other youth and youth, you invite youth and all that. Also next Saturday morning, the women's um, brunch is happening. The Girls of Grace are hosting this women's brunch. Our own Diane Norris will be speaking. And um, we ask that you, will, ladies, if you come and be a part of that, they'll have a silent auction going on. Uh, and, and the money's raised from the silent auction go to support missions in the community. Um, next Sunday is the fifth Sunday of this month, and, and we decided last year when we went to two services that when we had a fifth Sunday, we would have a combined worship service, and so with just one service and then a meal following. So um, remember, next Sunday, worship begins at 1030. 30 minutes earlier, 1030. Next Sunday, Sunday school is at 915. Worship's at 1030, and we're eating afterwards. The Girls of Grace are providing um, the, the fried chicken, and inside your order of worship, you have an insert, if you will, if you're planning to eat, if you will fill out your family name and, uh, and what you would like to bring, a side dish, vegetable, salad, or dessert. Um, if you will, just put that in the offering plate when it comes by. Please take note of all the things going on in the life of the church. And uh, we are glad that you're here, and we invite you to stand as we join together in singing this morning. And we got an acoustic set this morning because uh, we're missing a few band members, but enjoy anyway.
one more time. And you alone save me. Your brokenness is in me. You resurrect And you alone save me. You alone, one more time. You alone save me. Father, we love you and we thank you that you save us. And God, uh, we thank you for your brokenness. And God, we beg of you that even in our lives where we strive to, to have hope, God, that, that we would be broken in the right ways we would resemble the brokenness that you had on the cross, Father. That we would die to ourselves so that others may gain eternal life, Father, so that your name may be glorified. God, we love you. May your name be lifted up today. Amen. Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for this day, for all the many blessings you give us. Uh, thank you most of all for Jesus who died for our sins and forgives us of our sins and teaches us to forgive others of our sins. We pray for your glory, Lord, that it would uh, be in this church. And, uh, we know your, your power is, can be compared to the vastness of an iceberg, Lord. We just ask that uh, through our worship this morning, we can lift up the name of Jesus, and we pray that through your word, Lord, that Jason brings us, that uh, we could have healing, that we could have a new life. I pray that you knock on the door of someone's heart today who may have not opened it up fully to Jesus, that you give us courage uh, and strength to uh, open up our eyes and minds and our hearts to Jesus, Lord. Lord, I uh, just pray that you would be with us um, throughout the rest of this week as we start a new week tomorrow. We could uh, be in constant prayer as you would have us to teach us to pray, Lord. I pray that we could, um, today won't be the uh, last time before next Sunday that we hear your word. Teach us to read your word tomorrow, Tuesday and Wednesday and throughout the week, Lord. Pray that we could um, see uh, more than just the tip of that iceberg, Lord. Show us your power that, that you offer us. Again, thank you for the blessing of our church and for the opportunities we had to draw near you. Lord, I uh, pray that uh, for the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, how will be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Standing as we join together in affirming our faith this morning with the Apostles' Creed, and we do this every week to remind ourselves the essential truths of the Christian faith, let us join together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. While you're up, take a moment, greet those around you, welcome them to grace.
Let us continue worshiping God with God's tithe and our offering. And as we um, take this privilege, this opportunity to give back to God a portion of what is God's through God's tithe, let us always remember that God is faithful and that every day God provides exactly what we need. And as we consider all that God provides and as we consider that God has made us in His image and God has called us to be like His Son Jesus, that we can be more like God when we're giving. Because when we look at the life of Jesus... His life was centered around giving, giving of himself, not just his finances, but of himself. And so at this time, let us give back to God as we respond to God's love to us. Let us pray together. God, in our desire to be more like you, God, in our desire to love others the way you have loved us, let us know that it begins with how we give. So, Lord, let us take this privilege, this opportunity now to give back to you. And Lord, we ask that all that is received this day, that through the working of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that it will be blessed and multiplied, and that we would know that in the giving to the church, the church's responsibility is to turn around and give it right back out into the community and to this world. So, God, everything given today will be used to go and to further your name, Jesus, so that others will come to love you and receive the gift of salvation through you on the cross. In your name we pray. Amen.
children are now dismissed to Children's Church. Today's scripture reading is coming from the New Revised Standard Version, John 19, 28 through 30. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We are in the season of Lent, and the season of Lent is, is a time in which we, as hopefully you saw in the video, and we've been playing this video every week to, to help us remember to get ingrained into our way of thinking. Um, the season of Lent is a time for us, the church, to evaluate our life, to take inventory of our life, to think about what's in our life that is not of God and what we need to repent of, and, and that is to turn away from and turn towards God. And so we've been in a sermon series entitled Learning to Live, and, and if we're going to... Um, follow after God, if we're going to repent of, of the things in our life that should not be there and follow after, follow after God, it, in essence, it's a way of learning to live. It's learning to live in a different way than what we've been living is what that's about. And so today, we're, we're going to talk um, about trusting God at all times, and, and so we're, we're going to set that up, and, and here's the whole point of, of trusting God, is that every one of us at some point in our life Either you have already had it, um, you're in the midst of it now, or it's been a while, but you will find yourself in that situation again. It, it's a feeling of a, of a wilderness. You feel all alone. You feel like even when you cry out to God and call on God's name, God's not even there and God's not answering. If you're, if you're not there now, you will be there eventually. And I'm not trying to be doom and gloom on you. I'm just telling you that's life. And so that's part of our takeaway today in this is idea of learning to live in the wilderness is that life's journey takes us into the wilderness or takes us through the wilderness but God is still there life's journey takes us through the wilderness but God is still there and as I was thinking about this whole idea of being in the wilderness I asked Amber the other day I said have I shared this story at Grace and she said yeah I think so and so I followed up with that well I'm going to share it again and and I've only lived 33 years. There's only so many stories I have. So if, if I've shared it, which I'm pretty positive I have, um, just endure it and act like you had never heard it before. But anyway, the story I'm thinking about and this whole idea of being in the wilderness is, is a few years ago, um, a friend of mine, Matt, his name's Matt, he and I went mountain biking in, in Clemson, and, and we didn't have a specific time to be home. And that's probably because our wives have not given us a curfew for that day. So in the midst of riding, 
we said, you know what, let's, let's go on some different trails. Let's do something completely different. And, and it was the equivalent, really, of flipping a coin and, and saying, all right, we'll take a left here and a right here, and really not, no idea where we were. And it was late May, and it was hot, and, and we're running out of water. At least I'm running out of water. And we feel like we're so far away from the truck when we parked. Anxiety begins to kick in. I'm like, I don't know where we are in relationship to the truck. We're just a couple of preachers out here. Don't really know what we're doing when it comes to mapping our way back. By the way, we don't have a map. Um, and I'm thirsty. And so for all practical purposes, we were in the wilderness. And we didn't know where we were in location to how we needed to get back to the truck. We could try to guess our way. But anyway, and I run out of water. I'm thirsty. And we get to this creek, and this creek's flowing pretty well. And here's a part that you probably remember. Because I'm almost out of water, I decide, hey, I'm filling up. It's running. Supposedly, I heard somewhere that it purifies itself every so often. I don't know. So anyway, I get a bunch of water and start guzzling. I guzzle the whole way back. And, and the rest of the story is that I didn't end well about a few days later. And I'll leave the details at that. But here's what I remember about not only being sick, but the, that, that wilderness part and, and, and being thirsty is that in retrospect, I don't know why I got so anxious. Because we were not as far away from where we had parked as I thought. But anxiety kicked in. We were just freaking out. And I don't know about you, but in your life when anxiety kicks in, sometimes we find ourselves accusing others. And we were laughingly doing it, but really kind of being serious too. Like, Matt, it's your fault we're here. You don't want to say, let's go ride somewhere new. Duh. That was dumb. We should have just stayed on course. It's your fault. So anxiety kicks in, accusations start. I was in the wilderness. I was thirsty. Now, I don't know about you, but maybe you have not experienced anything like that in a, in a physical sense, but I will guarantee every one of us in some way, somehow, we have felt emotionally and spiritually in the wilderness at some point in our life. Maybe you're there today. You have felt in the wilderness in the sense of, God, I don't even feel you. God, I feel abandoned by you. I feel alone, and I am thirsty for, for some reassurance that you're there. I'm thirsty for a feeling of peace. God, I'm thirsty for something, not just a physical thirst, but I'm thirsty emotionally and spiritually, and I'm longing for you, and I'm longing for some realness in life. And here's, here's the issue with that. When we find ourselves in the tension of being in the wilderness, when we find ourselves in the tension of not only in the wilderness feeling like God's not there, but thirsty and desiring something that only God can provide, the, the temptation and the problem is that we will, if we're not careful, we will find ourselves going to contaminated sources of refreshment. In other words, we will go to a place that will only make us sick, or we will go to a place that is really an empty well and will not fill us up at all. And even to further that temptation in the wilderness, the, the, the temptation is to turn away from where God's leading you and what God's leading you through and to turn back to what you know, to turn back to what's familiar, to turn back to what's comfortable in your life. And oftentimes when we turn back to those things, we end up turning away from God. So I'm going to tell you today, life's journey take you through a wilderness but God is still there I want to read to us and I want, if you have your Bibles go ahead and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Exodus and if you're not familiar where that is go past Genesis and you will find it right after it we're going to be in Exodus chapter 17 we're going to read all seven verses here verses 1 through 7 of Exodus 17 From the wilderness of sin. When you want to be there? Where are you? I'm in the wilderness of sin. Anyway, from the wilderness of sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? 
But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Will you go on ahead of the people, take some of the elders of Israel with you, take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will be standing there in front of you and on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massah Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Now before we talk about that passage, let's think back some to this whole Exodus story. Um, just refresh our minds of what has happened to lead up to this point. Um, the Israelites were as slaves in Egypt. And you can go all the way back to the beginning of the book of Exodus. We're going to pick up in Exodus 3. They're slaves in Egypt. They're crying out to God, God, save us. God, bring us out of this slavery. We're being oppressed by the Egyptians, and we can't take it. We're your people. What's up? And so God raises up Moses and raises up Moses to lead out the Israelites. And God gives the Israelites exactly what they've been asking for, freedom from slavery. And so they begin this journey after seeing God's faithfulness throughout this whole process of getting them out of slavery, of how God did all that God did to get them out of slavery, they, they begin this process of traveling, journeying through the desert, the wilderness. And if you pick up in Exodus chapter 14, you'll see where they got to this body of water, and, and they look back, and they see Pharaoh pressing down hard on them, meaning he's like right behind them, and they're thinking, oh my goodness. They start complaining again. They're saying, Lord, you brought us out here to die. I mean, we could have died as slaves, and, and you let us free, and now we're going to be dead out here in the middle of nowhere. And, and God tells Moses, all right, just stick out your staff. The water's going to go... The land's going to be dry. You're going to cross over. If you're familiar with that story, you remember all that. They cross over dry ground. And then after they are all there um, over the, the, the dry ground, then it becomes moist again. The Egyptians begin to come on it. And it just they get stuck in there. The water poof, crashes back down on them. And they're like, whew, that was good. God, you're faithful. But then you get a few chapters over in chapter 16, and they're traveling some more, journeying some more through this wilderness, and they get hungry. They start crying out to God, God, we're hungry. We're going to die here of starvation. Moses, what have you done? You let us out here in the middle of nowhere. We're going to die. We should have just stayed as slaves. Yeah, we were slaves, but we have full bellies. And God's saying, I got food for you. And then we get to the chapter where we're in today. No doubt the Israelites are thirsty. They've been journeying through this desert. It's hot. They're parched. It's like having cotton in your mouth. And they begin to think, we're thirsty. Moses, you brought us out here. We're going to die first in the desert. We're going to start killing over right now. I know it. And Moses is like, why are y'all complaining again? And then Moses cries out to God, God, what am I going to do with these, your people? Here's what I think is, is interesting. It's funny how when we find ourselves in wilderness experiences, when we find ourselves feeling like God has abandoned us, when we find ourselves thirsty for something, and the only thing that's going to quench that thirst is God, but when we find ourselves thirsty, amnesia kicks in. And what I mean by that is we forget all the other times God's been faithful. And here's something to consider. I've already alluded to it somewhat, but this whole idea of, of the wilderness, when it tells it in the story of, of the Exodus here in 17, this whole idea of the wilderness is more than just a physical location. Throughout Scripture, when you, hear, when you see the wilderness, it's not just a physical location. It's a feeling of perceived abandonment by God. God, you're nowhere around. God, I, I, I'm looking for you, I'm trying to fill you, I'm praying to you, and you're nowhere there. I need you, I'm desperate, but God, where are you? And maybe you've been there, maybe you're there today, and maybe, just maybe, you, you feel guilty for that. And if that's the case, I want to remind you that Jesus knows how you feel. In fact, the scripture that was read this morning from Nancy is Jesus hanging on the cross. And it's not 
said in this gospel passage that she read, but there's another place in the gospels where Jesus cried out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God, I feel alone, I feel abandoned, like you're not even here. God, why have you forsaken me? And so Jesus there himself, having a wilderness experience as he's hanging on the cross, he feels like God, his father himself, has turned his back on him. All of his friends ran like little girls. And then he says, I thirst. And I would challenge us to think that that thirst was more than just a physical thirst. It was a longing for God's presence, to feel God, to know God's there. It was a longing for reassurance from God. And so here's what else I think about a wilderness experience. A lot of times a wilderness experience is in the smack dab middle, caught in between a redemptive act of God and God's promises being fulfilled. Think about it. The Israelites, redemptive act, they had just come out of slavery. The promise fulfilled the land that God said, I have for you. They're right there in the middle of it, but they're in this wilderness experience. Jesus, same thing. He's in the process of this redemptive act of dying on the cross, and the promise fulfilled is the resurrection and the creation of the church and bringing God's people back to himself. But he's caught in the middle of it, and it's a wilderness experience. God, where are you? God, I don't feel you. God, I need to know you're there. And God, I'm thirsty for you. So back to this story. The Israelites are crying out to Moses. We're thirsty, and they're crying out against God. We're thirsty. We're going to die out here. And, and Moses turns to God. God, what do you want me to do? What are you going to do with these people? They're going to kill me, God. They're that thirsty. They're going nuts on me, man. Come on. And God says, I'll tell you what you do. You, you gather some of the elders. And, and those are people of, of like mind, of, of like vision, of like purpose. You gather them up, the ones who have not gone crazy on you yet, Moses, is really what he's saying. And you go to this rock. And you take that staff in your hand. That is a symbol of my power and my presence with you. You take that staff in your hand. And when you get to that rock, you notice verse 6. Look at what verse 6 says. God says to Moses, I will be standing there in front of you. My presence is with you. And I want you to strike that rock. And when you strike that rock, water is going to come out. And I want you to remember, Moses, that my presence is with you. And I provide everything you need at just the right time. My presence and my provision are with you. Even though they felt that God wasn't there, God said, Moses, I want you to know I'm going to be right there on that rock in front of you. And this story ends, water is provided, and it ends with verse 7 of Moses naming this place, and he's naming it because of, uh, of, of the affliction and the quarreling they have had with each other. And it ends with a question, and this is a wilderness question. Is the Lord among us or not? We ask it another way, God, are you here or not? God, are you listening to me? God, where were you when that happened? God, why? God, how could you let this happen? Those are the ways we ask, is the Lord among us or not? And if you've ever asked that question or those questions, you've been in the wilderness. And life's journey will take us through the wilderness, but God's still there. And I don't know how many times I've read this Exodus story. And every time I read it, I find myself wanting to do the same thing over and over and over. And, and here recently it's finally hit me. And the same thing I want to do over and over and over is read this story and think, man, y'all are dummies. Y'all Israelites, y'all are some hard-headed people. Talk about Pharaoh having a hard heart. Y'all Israelites, y'all are hard-headed. Y'all are always turning away from God. You're never trusting God. Do you not remember? I mean, amnesia is strong in your brain, obviously, because you don't remember anything of how faithful God is. But we do the same thing. We do the same thing. And in life, when everything's going good, we think everything's right with, with, with God and me, and, and everything's just great. There's no problems. But when everything hits the fan, 
Maybe we begin to think God is judging us or God is punishing us. But what if? It's just a part of life. It's a part of this wilderness experience that we're caught in between the redemptive act of what God has done for all people and the promise to be fulfilled. And life's journey is going to have a wilderness experience to it and probably over and over and over again. And the, the, the temptation is to think, God, you're nowhere there. You're nowhere around. But the reality is God is there. God is there. And if we're not careful, the temptation will be in feeling that we are alone and abandoned and thirsty for God's presence. The temptation will be to turn back and to go to what's comfortable, to go to what's normal. The temptation will be to go to these empty wells or these contaminated waters that will only make us sick and that will only break down relationships. And God says, why do you do that? Because I'm there. You may not feel me, but I'm there. I am there. And here's what I love about this story, too. The wilderness experience for the Israelites is about learning to trust God. It's about learning to trust God in the good times and the bad. God, you just did something amazing. You brought us across this water. I mean, there were walls of water on each side of us. And a few chapters over, they're learning to trust God again. And another chapter, they're learning to trust God again. And that's significant because every relationship is built on trust. And it's no different than with God. So I would imagine this morning that if you're experiencing a wilderness deal in your life, and you're thirsty and you're striving for something, you're striving for an answer, you're striving for help, you're striving for hope, God says, don't go to the empty wells. Don't go to the contaminated water. I'm there. Don't turn back to what you used to do. Don't turn back to who you were. Don't turn back to what's comfortable. Turn to me. I'm there. We have a video this morning that sets it up with some other experiences of wilderness.
find yourself in a wilderness, what are you turning to? The temptation is to turn to everything but God. But the reality is what you need is God. When you're thirsty for something to fill you up, what are you turning to? If it's anything other than God, you will never be filled. I don't know where you are today, but if you find yourself in the wilderness, God says, I'm there. Even if you feel like I'm not, I'm there. And you need me. And all the lies of the world will never fill you up. Life's journey will take us through a wilderness. But God is still there. The worship team is going to play a song that we're familiar with it's entitled you never let go and God never does God is always there and so I would encourage you that if you find yourself this morning in a wilderness experience know God's there I also want you to know this altar is open if you like prayer all you have to do is ask Let's pray. God, in the midst of every one of our lives, we're either there today or we will find ourselves there eventually in a wilderness. God, we will find ourselves thirsty, thirsty for a feeling of, of you being there, thirsty for fulfillment. But Lord, let us not be tempted to turn towards the contaminated or empty wells. Let us turn to the one that we need, and that is you. You are with us at all times. Because of your love and your grace and your mercy, you never let go of us. Jesus, work in our hearts this morning. Amen.